Uh, good morning, all. Thank you for joining us. We're very happy to have you on a somewhat soggy morning in California, and hopefully the rest of the country is doing better. I think snow is headed your way. Um, Dr. Sagar and I are here to uh, moderate our call this morning. Dr. Uh, McGinn is on vacation. We have two delightful guests from uh, Omaha and Creighton University, Dr. John Cote and Kelly Fairfield. Now I'm gonna start with introductions and then uh, Kelly will go first, uh, Dr. Cote second, and Dr. Sagar will be our panel moderator for the day. So first, Dr. Cote is the site leader at CHI Women's Health Lakeside in Omaha and an assistant professor at Creighton University School of Medicine in the department of OBGYN. He received his MD from the Creighton School of Medicine and continued in residency um, and obstetrics and gynecology at Creighton. He's a fellow in the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology and a diplomat of the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's been involved with resident and student teaching for 26 years and considers himself a physician scientist. He's been involved in multiple industry-sponsored trials involving endometriosis and has worked closely with his nerd friends um, in the Department of Pharmacology and Neuroscience to create a unique mouse model to research chronic diseases. We talked uh, uh, just prior about his interest in 3D printing, um, uh, virtual reality, video games, and technology. Um, uh, his uh, French Canadian roots requires him to be a hockey fan following the Colorado Avalanche since their days in Quebec. And uh, Kelly Fairfield is a physical therapist with specialization in conditions affecting the pelvic region. She graduated from Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, Scotland in 2000. I did not detect an accent and uh, has been with CHI Health since 2005. Uh, her uh, role is as a navigator in the public health center. Uh, she frequently encounters patients who have suffered from pelvic pain and dysfunction often for years as they're trying to seek answers. She works to guide these patients through the process of finding comprehensive and holistic solutions for their condition um, through multidisciplinary collaborative effort of providers at the pe uh, pelvic health center. So with that, we'll get started. And Kelly, I think you're up first. Welcome and happy to have you both. Thank you very much. And I can I can share my screen here if that's all right. Great. And yes, I'm, I am I'm Kelly Fairfield. I work as the navigator for the Pelvic Health Center. And uh, just briefly, the Pelvic Health Center functions as a multidisciplinary collaborative group. We, we organized as a hub and spoke model so that we can deliver services throughout our community. We meet virtually to discuss complicated cases. And we also uh, meet through EPIC, through our, our EMR, um, through EPIC messaging and EPIC chat to um, discuss the complicated cases on a, on a more um, direct level and um, in the moment. You know, just briefly, obviously, um, not everybody has um, this kind of group organized at this point or a navigator connecting services, but, but everyone has all of these disciplines. All, all these specialized fields have existed for a long time and do their work and do it very well. Um, we found within, within our system, within CHI Health here in Omaha, we were operating kind of in silos with, with these specialized groups, um, not efficiently referring with it among, among one another. And um, we were able to streamline our referrals and, um, and that ability to collaborate uh, to find answers for our patients. And that, that has been very meaningful and um, it's, got, it's gone very nicely. <clears throat> What we found as we build that model is that because of the sensitive and personal nature of the symptoms, many people were accessing our services um, through online web searches. Um, so we sort of optimi optimized our website accordingly um, in order to access my services. Um, people are prompted to call this direct line, um, dedicated phone line to me. They might take an assessment, uh, an online assessment where a positive score with the patient's permission will prompt an email that comes to me and then I connect with the patient to um, answer their questions or facilitate service referrals. Again, as patients are kind of from the comfort and privacy of their home, looking up their conditions, they um, look at treatment options that they've heard about. So for example, with um, 
with the CNN segment or, or other um, national news that talks about advances like 3D ultrasound printing and Dr. Cote's work there, they might look up or find these things through our advanced treatment options um, section there, or, or they may be looking up specific symptoms or conditions, which will send them to our endometriosis page. Um, the patients will access that uh, page, find out more about conditions like endometriosis. And then again, they'll have the prompts to be directed to my navigator line. <clears throat> From there, I, I kind of do a little decision tree slash triage um, questioning. I'll, I'll ask it, of course, for some red flags, you know, urgent, urgent needs. Um, I, I've, I've got the time to hear the patient tell their story in their way. Uh, I work with the patient to kind of make a plan using, again, the, the depth of the resources that we enjoy being such a large national system, you know, through common spirit. Um, you know, for example, a, a patient might might be calling me and they're talking about constipation and I begin to think of um, gastrointestinal or nutrition services, physical therapy to address a musculoskeletal condition. Um, you know, constipation may be related to to dysynergic uh, function of the internal and external sphincter. So I might be thinking along those lines, but but as we're speaking, uh, they, they mention that they're on a, a number of narcotics uh, and that's likely contributing to their constipation. And I ask what that's about. And they say, well, you know, I've got this abdominal pain. Um, you know, it, it, it comes with my cycle. My mom had it too, my sister's got it. Um, you know, my mom just always said for me to, you know, take these pain meds and this is what we've always been doing. And, um, you know, I asked them a little bit more about that. You know, some of those symptoms. Okay, so it comes with your cycle. So it seems, you know, based in, in your hormone uh, cycle and, you know, yes, no, I've got some questions and I might say, you know, have you, you know, who have you talked to your OB, your obstetrician, your gynecologist about this? Have you, who have you discussed this with? And, you know, have you ever heard of Dr. Cote? He's doing some great work in this area. And, and you know, I prompt them over to, um, to his page. You know, I say, you know, watch his video, read some of the related news that he talks about. Um, related to, I don't tell, I, I don't know. I, I don't tell them that they have endometriosis by any means. I don't even discuss those things, but I refer the patients on to someone who's going to know more. And I, and I let the experts take it from there. I'm happy to answer questions about any of those things, but I'll hand it over to Dr. Cote to talk about the good work that he's doing. Uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, uh, Dr. Greenswig and uh, Dr. Sagar for inviting us to be able to speak on this particular topic. I like to thank Kelly. I like to thank you know, my wife, my kids, all of my uh, colleagues and uh, CHI uh, that have helped with the endometriosis projects that we've kind of worked with, um, because I think that it's because of them, uh, the, the research coordinators, uh, the, the students, and the participants in all of these trials, that we're going to be able to kind of extend this, um, you know, research and the findings that we have to actually better our patients and kind of uh, create what, what they need, which is people uh, that can help them in the long run. And, and these disease states, especially like endometriosis, are chronic disease states. Uh, it's appropriate that we're gonna be talking about this today because it is uh, Endometriosis Awareness Month. And because of that, I think that it's important to kind of look at uh, this as not just uh, uh, the beginning, uh, but uh, uh, something that's gonna continue on, at least with uh, the research that we're doing here at Creighton and with CHI and Common Spirit. The learning objectives for this talk though, are specifically defining endometriosis because there's a paradigm shift, diagnosing endometriosis because there's a paradigm shift and treating endometriosis because there's a paradigm shift. And what do I mean by that? It's because when we've looked at endometriosis in, in the past, we may have been thinking of it in one way and currently, we're trying to think of it in a different way in terms of how we diagnose and treat this disease state because it's so significant for our patients. Now, the theme of this talk, I like to say, is, is you know, the age-old age uh, question of what's, what's better, Star Trek versus Star Wars. And in my opinion, 
um, is, you know, dude, seriously, we're all nerds here. Because I think that in the end, when we deal with things like endometriosis, even though there's a paradigm shift, we can kind of take um, things from all the different recommendations that come about from all the societies. Because there's at least eight different guidelines that are out there that we kind of can look to to try to see how we diagnose and treat this disease state. Um, but they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, and you can combine different things in trying to, to treat and diagnose this disease. So what is endometriosis? You know, in, in general, the, the uh, etiology of the word, you know, endo from Latin, uh, it, you know, inside, uh, metra, the Greek uh, with womb or uterus and osis, the disease state, we're dealing with, and, you know, endometrial tissue or endometrium-like tissue that have uh, gotten outside of the uterus. Uh, and ultimately, it's also associated with an inflammatory process. Uh, now, this is as opposed to, let's say, things like adenomyosis, which is where the endometrial tissue buries inside the, the muscle of the uterus. Um, it's actually something that's going to be um, pretty clear as far as the definition with all the different societies. So we know what endometriosis is. It does affect about 176 million women worldwide or about 10% of the population. But a lot of people think that that's underdiagnosed just based on how we can actually diagnose this disease. It affects about $22 billion worth of healthcare costs and lost work uh, per year. And, and that's a significant amount of, of you know, impact uh, on not just our economies, but the world economy. Now, in terms of defining endometriosis, there's distinctly three different subtypes that people try to define, uh, superficial, deep infiltrating, and, and endometrioma. Uh, but we also see endometriosis in extra abdominal thoracic regions, umbilical endometriosis, and brain endometriosis, which again, these are things that uh, go to just the uh, etiology of, of where this disease state is coming from. There's iatrogenic cesarean scar endometriosis that can come about. And uh, many of us have, have found this in different uh, port sites when we go through laparoscopic procedures with patients. And in fact, endometriosis can be found in men. In fact, Dr. Filoni, one of our urology colleagues uh, um, had a recent 2018 publication uh, with Dr. Ray um, dealing with a case report and um, uh, systematic review of this particular type of disease state. Uh, when we deal with endometriosis in general, then that's, that's what we're dealing with. These, these different heterogeneous areas where we can find this disease state. Now the etiology continuing with endometriosis etiology can be different, just like you can have all kinds of uh, reasons uh, for having any kind of cancer. You can have all kinds of reasons for potentially getting endometriosis. Samson's retrograde uh, uh, menstruation theory is kind of prevailing theory that people go along with, but that doesn't mean that you can't have uh, all of these other issues kind of coming into play as far as creating uh, the disease state that allows for uh, the glands to get outside of the uterus and implant. We know that women have retrograde menstruation, but not all women tend to get endometriosis. So there's gotta be an, an, uh, a link between these types of uh, uh, issues that allow for this. We also know because we can have endometriosis outside of the thoracic cat or inside the thoracic cavity, outside of the abdominal cavity, that there may, must be some other reason for having endometriosis that can be spread in different uh, forms and in different ways. So when we deal with endometriosis, I usually like to talk about the trifecta of endometriosis, uh, the, the three pains that we tend to see, dysmenorrhea, non-menstrual pelvic pain, and dyspareunia. Now, when we talk about endometriosis, this talk isn't necessarily gonna be dealing with infertility. It's gonna be dealing more with potentially pain, uh, but uh, at least 30 to 50% of women with endometriosis also experience infertility. And that's 
a big part of this disease state. Uh, pain issue though, tends to be what uh, people come in for. And in fact, this is what creates a lot of the problems within the ERs, uh, with the opioid ep epidemic crisis that we're seeing is this pain issue. So in fact, in uh, 2000, back in 2008, um, this, this actually kind of shows you where the uh, over 5,500 women uh, with uh, a comparison between with endometriosis and without uh, their symptomatologies. And you can see the whole gamut. This essentially represents my day in the clinic when people come in with a chief complaint because all of these issues tend to come up. And because of that, we see that this is a, a, a heterogeneous disease state that can come about in many different forms. But in fact, it, it all at the base has pain as its base. In fact, the comorbidities that we see not only deal with the etiology of endometriosis, but also go to the fact that even in our non-OBGYN uh, specialties, people that see these types of things should keep in the back of their head that endometriosis could be a part of someone's life in the future, if not currently. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, interstitial cystitis, thyroid disease, celiac disease, ischemic heart disease, these all uh, tend to have links or comorbidities with endometriosis. And it's uh, uh, not a one direction uh, comorbidity. It's, it's bi-directional, meaning you can have these risks in both directions. If someone has endometriosis, you have to watch out for these disease states, or if they have these disease states, you have to watch out for endometriosis. I think we can have our polling question. So can you diagnose endometriosis without surgery? Yes, no, or maybe. I don't know how much time we want to give people. We don't want to give you the answer. But the interesting thing is, let's see, we've got about 35% saying yes, 29% no, and 35% maybe. The interesting thing is that's where this paradigm shift is coming into play because uh, as far as at least back in 2019, Agarwal was suggesting that we need to move towards this ideal of not having to diagnose endometriosis surgically. Now, the problem with endometriosis diagnoses is that the studies show that it takes about six to 10 years for someone to actually have symptoms to be by the time they then get diagnosed with endometriosis, which is a travesty for a lot of patients because that's pain that they have to undergo and not getting the treatment that they potentially need. In fact, the studies show that people, including seeing gynecologists, will have at least three plus 55% of the time doctors that they're going to see before they're diagnosed and about 22% of the time five plus physicians before they're actually truly diagnosed with endometriosis, which means we're not doing our patients uh, a service by not focusing on some of the, you know, pain uh, perspectives or, or this diagnosis as being a possibility. Endometriosis does have a strong familial component. Uh, first degree relatives increase the risk for endometriosis diagnosis by at least uh, 10 uh, or seven to ten percent, or seven to ten time fold, um, and in fact, ACOG does suggest that the gold standard uh, for surgical or, uh, of diagnosis of endometriosis is surgical visualization and histology. The interesting thing about this is that um, even when we do surgery, we're not perfect about diagnosing endometriosis by visualizing the endometriotic lesions that a histological diagnosis is, is necessary to some degree when you actually want to diagnose endometriosis. Now, this is from the standpoint of 
what do we do going forward? Because if we have a working diagnosis of endometriosis, meaning we don't necessarily need to have the surgical intervention, then we can actually start treating the endometriosis medically before we actually get into the surgical interventions. In fact, uh, the European uh, Society for, uh, uh, I think it's Eshire, the European Society for, uh, what is it, uh, Hormone Infertility Reproduction and Embryology, I believe, is no longer the diagnostic gold standard for visualization of endometriosis that they suggest that we have, can have an empirical treatment uh, for endometriosis uh, in, in treating our patients appropriately. That means that we have to actually have ideas of how we are supposed to treat them. In, in the future though, what's exciting is that we have some new areas where we can actually diagnose endometriosis without actually having to do surgery. Although these are not uh, indicated uh, for uh, treatment, endometrial biopsy has been shown potentially with unmyelinated sensory C fibers to increase uh, the chances of diagnosing endometriosis if that is found. To date, there's no individual serum markers that can be used but I know a lot of people have seen or have been looking at CA-125, CA-199, CA-174, garolins, microRNAs, interleukins, et cetera, uh, to try to see if we can actually find a blood test that we can diagnose endometriosis with. As of yet, we can't do that. Urine, collagen, alpha-1 chain precursors, and esfatin-1 have been looked at in the urine. But again, these are not being seen in prospect of trials to actually being uh, uh, usable yet. This is the future. Um, currently, there's uh, circulating endometrial cell uh, uh, blood tests that are being looked at uh, in different ways to try to diagnose endometriosis uh, as well. But these are things that um, what we could do uh, in the future is not have to do surgery to actually diagnose endometriosis uh, and we can actually draw these, these blood tests. So from the treatment standpoint, the American College of OBGYN uh, and uh, the ASRM uh, advocate for having endometriosis being looked at as a medical disease first with a surgical backup, which means essentially if we can treat um, the symptoms of individuals that we think have endometriosis uh, with uh, the medications that are available to us and get relief, we don't necessarily have to do the surgery. In fact, some of the uh, research that has been looked at uh, has suggested that we eliminate some of the, uh, the treatments in the past that we've tried to use, like danazol or antiprogestins, uh, laparoscopic uricycle neck ablations. Uh, but uh, for the future, what we want to do is we want to look at options that can actually get to the, uh, the, the root cause of endometriosis. And so we know that endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent disease um, state. And so that means we have to try to uh, address the, the estrogen. And because estrogen is something that's ubiquitous uh, in women until they get through, through menopause, what we try to do is we try to treat uh, the, the pain symptoms first, and then we try to deal with the, the estrogen uh, causes of endometriosis. So we've all seen this probably in the past where non-steroidals are being used, contraceptive therapies are being used, things like IUDs, modified testosterone, although that's not necessarily being recommended now, and then the GnRH agonists, as well as the uh, um, uh, aromatase inhibitors may be used to try to uh, affect uh, the pain that's coming from endometriosis. We know that contraception, um, in fact, in, in, in trying to affect uh, the endometriosis pain tends to help the pain that's at the beginning stages, like let's say dysmenorrhea, and tends to work better with that than the non-menstrual pelvic pain. Uh, from the standpoint though of having uh, newer options, 
what's exciting is that we were uh, a part of trials, industry sponsored trials at Creighton and CHI, where we're looking at the GNRH antagonists, which are uh, the examples of relagolix, estradiol, norethindrone acetate, and elagolix. Uh, the FDA has approved these uh, treatments for uh, moderate to severe pain for endometriosis. There are other uh, uh, GNRH antagonists that are on the market, but they are not uh, ad or indicated for endometriosis pain. In fact, a lot of the reproductive endocrinologists have used them for fertility treatments, not necessarily related to endometriosis at all. From the elagolic standpoint, uh, Taylor uh, in 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine suggested uh, with their uh, similar double-blind randomized six-month phase three trial of two different doses of the GnRH antagonist, uh, 150 milligrams once a day and 200 milligram BID doses that they could help with um, endometriosis pain. And what they found was not only was there an improvement in uh, pain, but there was no increase in uh, analgesia uh, pain medications, which meant that from the opioid standpoint, we're not going to have people increase the amount of opioids that they're using to treat the pain related to endometriosis, but we can actually try to help their pain and decrease their use of those narcotics. Now, the interesting thing about this is that um, even though there's benefits, there's always risks, and the hypoestrogenic adverse effects of the GnRH antagonist was seen. We, we see uh, the agonist as being maybe potentially not as uh, worse, at least on the bone mass uh, issue, uh, but there was still some bone mineral density issues with this particular drug as well. From the relagolic estradiol north or an acetate standpoint, similar trial to replicate phase three multicenter randomized double blind placebo controlled trials that we were a part of, there was a benefit of uh, pain as well as a decrease in opioid use. Um, but again, there was uh, hypoestrogenic side effects. In particular, uh, the bone mineral density issue was there. Now, um, Barbieri had a theory uh, with the estrogen uh, threshold hypothesis where we might be able to get the estrogen down low enough where we get benefits, uh, but we don't have as much of the side effects. If there's a sweet spot that we can get to, then we might be able to get to the point where we don't have as many of the side effects. Now, pain treatment. And this is where Kelly uh, comes in um, you know, to this particular piece because I think it, it's a multidisciplinary approach. We need to take uh, our Star Trek and Star Wars analogies and, and bring them together because I think we can all get this uh, together to try to treat these patients. Uh, physical therapy and the physical therapists that we have can help with treating our patients without having to use potential medications. Uh, Gabby Penton's an option, uh, ambitriptyline's an option, Botox, SSRIs, TENS units, melatonin. There's so many ways that we can help our patients before we take them to surgery or even in addition to surgery. Because with surgical intervention, even though we can kind of deperitonealize the endometriotic lesions, we don't necessarily solve the problem of endometriosis because it's a chronic disease. At Creighton, we've had the CHI mouse model that we've tried to produce uh, because better animal models are needed. We've used a, a mouse uh, with uh, trying to uh, uh, continue to keep the, the mouse intact and in implant uh, endometrial tissue from a synergistic mouse into uh, the mouse and actually produce endometriosis. And in doing so, we have an immune competent intact recipient that we can look at different therapeutic interventions with. Um, you can see here on the right-hand side though, the meculum, that's uh, the mouse speculum that I 3D printed. We don't actually use that, but I thought I'd give a, a plug to 3D printing. 
So what's for the future? Clinical and translational options. We have CGRP antagonists, mimetic peptides, sphingosine kinase pathway uh, issues, GPR antagonists. Uh, so a different way to look at the uh, G protein uh, estrogen receptors and IL-8 antibodies, uh, which recently has been shown in a monkey model to try to help uh, endometriosis. All right. Uh, Dr. Sagar, I think you sure. want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this this month. Yes. And then... <laughs> so. yes. uh, first, big thank you to both Dr. Cote as well as uh, Kelly, because um, I think this is a very timely topic. So March is Endometriosis Awareness Month. And part of the reason it is designated this stature is because it is an underdiagnosed um, entity. And we need to understand that this is something that's very much um, burdensome to our patients because they are going through their life without having the appropriate diagnosis or management of their symptoms. And March is also Women's History Month. And just this week, we celebrate International Women's Day. So I feel this is a very appropriate topic for us to talk about. So thank you for taking the time. One of the things I wanted to ask you and really looking to both of you to comment on is the model that you described is really multidisciplinary because there are so many nuances depending on the patient. Can you talk a little bit about how you developed that interdisciplinary model and if somebody wanted to adopt this sort of a model what is the step one and two that they should do kelly i'm having a little bit of trouble with my internet connection so hopefully you guys can hear me okay yeah yes yeah. um i think that your question was related to development of the multidisciplinary model right and uh, we're doing a presentation at the American Women's Obstetrics and Neonatal Conference um, in June this year, because there's been an, a, an awful lot of interest. Because again, as I said, uh, all of these specialized fields have always existed and, and done their job so well. And um, what we didn't do is take a lot of time and raise a lot of money and build a structure and uh, staff uh, a building and those kinds of things in order to create the pelvic health center. We capitalized on some learnings that we all gained, you know, through COVID and connecting um, virtually, doing our meetings virtually so that we don't take up too much patient care time from our various providers. And then also teachers to attach the patient so that we can all in our own time take a look at the patient history, do our own kind of, you know, deep dive into their medications and those kinds of things and, and do a quick exchange of information and collaboration. It's been really wonderful. Um, so it took um, a, a, a vision, Lisa Strassheim uh, had, a, had a vision, an idea of how we could do better based on a patient story that she heard. Um, my, my boss, Ann Nelson, figured out how to make that happen and, and did all the strategy and, and all the heavy lifting uh, to and kind of told me what to do. And then um, we all just kind of began to connect and, and people were very patient with me as I learned how to use uh, Zoom. Um, but it, it's but it's been wonderful and we've all learned and grown quite a bit. I, I can't speak to Dr. Cote's experience um, as a provider and, and, and being patient as we began to connect, but I think it I, I hear frequently people being very relieved well again, and where is behavioral health? How can I, this person needs counseling. Um, they, they've lost all intimacy, um, you know, in their relationship and in their committed relationship and uh, they're trying to find a way to, to reconnect with their partner um, through their experience with dyspareunia, th that kind of thing, sexual dysfunction and all of that. So that's that's been the thing that I hear the most is just how do I make that happen? And and I'm glad that I can though. Wonderful. And Dr. Cote, did you want to add anything on the topic? No, just to just to you know mirror what you know Kelly was saying. I think that, you know, as a, a general OBGYN, just having some of the specialties uh, that are there, colorectal, um, uh, urogynecology, because in these difficult cases that we end up doing 
um, surgeries on, you know, you need to have that backup uh, because, you know, these are difficult cases. I, I think Gynox would prefer to have a cancer case, you know, 10 of them before they have an endometriosis case because it's just so difficult to, to deal with these types of patients. And that's also some places where the 3D printing may come in handy as well with pre-surgical planning. I know that, you know, we've been trying to do stuff with that as well to help when we do get to the point where someone needs or, or desires surgery. Um, uh, I think that that's where the Pelvic Floor Health Center has kind of helped us to connect all these subspecialties in, in one place. Um, I have a, there's one question in the chat. Maybe we'll do that first. And then I have a question also. Um, the question in the, in the question and answer is there's a 24 month um, limit to the use of Orlissa and Myfembri due to the potential effects of bone mass density, especially for younger patients. Any trips, uh, tips or tricks on getting insurance to authorize the medications for longer than 24 months, especially if the patient is doing well. Um, um, uh, maybe a DEXA to document normal density of 24 months, question mark. Yeah, so that's that's a problem that I think, again, insurance is, is part of the, the issue. I have not had a lot of dif difficulties in transitioning someone from one GnRH antagonist to the other but I also want to keep the patient safe. So I would do a DEXA scan. And so I've done that in the past where I've taken someone off of, let's say one of the drugs and then put them on the other drug, but potentially making sure that their BMD is, is doing okay. Uh, and I haven't had too, many, too much pushback from insurance based on that. All right, um, thank you. And so my question is, um, uh, at the beginning of the talk, when you were talking about etiologies, you said that um, for endometriosis, it can pop up and cause a variety of conditions and listed a laundry list of things from thyroids to lung disease and so on and so forth. But then you also said um, that these same conditions create high risk for patients to have endometriosis, that it went both ways, at least that's as I understood it. Now, I may be wrong, but to the, um, uh, is that... Is that true? And, and if so, is there a reason? So, yeah, so the, I, I guess not the, the comorbidity, yes. meaning you, you may have these associated disease states together. So like, for instance, it, it can be someone that has rheumatoid arthritis and then they can also have endometriosis. So yes. I think it goes to the point of this being an immune uh, regulated disease state that it has to deal something with the immune mm. system and, and aberration, which again, autoimmune diseases can be interconnected. But like if, if we can see someone with melanoma and there's a more, uh, a likely chance that they could have endometriosis and vice versa, then those are things for us to just be aware of. Or if someone that had endometriosis, could they be at increased risk for coronary heart disease down the road mm -hmm. to be aware of that? And one of those ideas that we have is to kind of combine all of this with like our pelvic floor health center and saying, hey, if someone has endometriosis, do you need a cardiologist? Do you need a a rheumatologist, you need someone else because maybe there's a, an increased risk for you to have these other disease states. Okay. Um, I think we're waiting on more questions to be submitted from the audience members. Uh, one question I had, so I'm a practicing primary care physician and you know, if I'm in my practice, can you give me ideas on like, when should I think about endometriosis? Because Patients may present to your point in very different ways. Um, when should we really think about a differential diagnosis to include endometriosis and how do we bring it up to the top of the concern? Like, how do you do that in your practice? So there's, there's a lot of different tools that are out there. They haven't been 
completely validated, but that's the hope that we can get some kind of validated tools to be able to get these questionnaires out there. But just something as simple as, um, you know, uh, using the menstrual period as a vital sign and seeing what someone's period is, how is it heavy? Is it irregular? Is it painful? And those are the kinds of things that I think will help suggest that that's a possibility. Great, thank you. Uh, and I think we have another question from the audience. And this one is, any techniques, tips you could offer on maximizing the diagnosis of endometriosis during diagnostic laparoscopy? So, um, you know, anyone that is doing a diagnostic laparoscopy for endometriosis in particular, you could do a biopsy and not find endometriosis and still they could have endometriosis. My specific, you know, recommendation is that we treat the symptoms for the patient. And even if you don't have a biopsy proven diagnosis of endometriosis, we can still treat them the same way that we would treat someone that had endometriosis. And so there's no specific thing that I can point out other than you know, judiciously taking biopsies if you see something questionable. Mm -hmm. I have one, oops, um, well, I guess I'm off date. Um, I have one additional question that is sort of a follow-up to that. And that is, um, you mentioned that even if you take out um, all the lesions that it doesn't necessarily cure uh, endometriosis. And is that because it, you really didn't take out all the lesions, like you left the most important one, but you didn't see it? Or is it because it recurs and people get new lesions or neither? Uh, both, actually. Yeah. You, can, oh. you can leave, you can leave uh, you know, implants or you can have uh, what we call ovarian remnants, or you could um, have the aromatase activity locally with the uh, endometriosis that you miss that could continue to create problems with endometriosis. Got it. All right. Continue to have the menstruation and then it yes. comes back. Comes back. Well, I think this was a fantastic topic. Thank you so much for addressing it for us. And I think we have a couple of key learnings that each of us could walk away with. Uh, when we're thinking about our patients, when we're thinking about program building. So thank you for sharing both of your expertise and insights. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our audience. Thanks for the questions. Um, we are back, I believe, next week um, with uh, our quarterly conversation around gun safety. So that should be an interesting call. I hope people will join us. And uh, I'd just like to add my thanks, Dr. Cote and Kelly. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, lots to think about here. And it sounds like we still have a bit of ways to go in the journey to try and get our arms around this fully. So thank you, that's great, really appreciate it. Thanks everybody, have a safe weekend and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah.